thank you so much, uh, uh, and thank you, Alex, for the invitation. And and really, first, I want to just give tremendous kudos to the students who have put together really what has been an amazing symposium. So let's give them a nice round of applause. by all reports has been absolutely outstanding uh, and the type of uh, information and knowledge that's been gained today I think is, is something that, that is really admirable and I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for this particular cohort of students that I've actually grown very uh, close to over the last two years uh, in, both both here and abroad we've had uh, seen a number of the students who, who I've had the great fortune of traveling with. Uh, with that, my name is Gary Parker. I'm the Deputy Director of the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, which is located at the Silver School of Social Work. Uh, and we study issues of poverty and how they impact children and families, and then help develop interventions to alleviate the, the often terrible consequences that come with, uh, with uh, living in poverty. And I'm thrilled to be a moderator for today's panel. Uh, before I start, just so everyone knows what to expect, I'll introduce each of our esteemed speakers, they'll be given about 10 minutes uh, to get some remarks, and then we want to turn it right over to Q&A so we can get all of your uh, questions uh, as, we, as we go. So with that, I am uh, very, very delighted and honored to present our panel of speakers. We have uh, Vincent Chiraldi, who's been the commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation since February 2010 a social work graduate of NYU Silver in the house, <laughs> also an, uh, an adjunct of uh, teaches policy at the Silver School, is that right? You've also taught at Wagner in the past, is that right? Uh, yeah, where he teaches uh, juvenile justice. Uh, the commissioner has 30 years of experience collaborating with community criminal justice partners and transforming the lives of probationers for the better. He equips both child and adult probationers with the support they need to live a crime-free, productive, healthy lifestyle. The commissioner was a founder and executive director of the Justice Policy Institute, which conducts research on the impacts of mass incarceration, over-representation uh, of minorities in prisons, and through the Justice Policy Institute, he led numerous justice system reform campaigns in multiple states. And he, uh, out of that, grew the juvenile, uh, the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice, a nonprofit agency founded by the commissioner in 1991, which addressed alternative solutions to social problems outside of imprisonment. And he's a recognized expert in the field of juvenile justice. Then we'll be hearing from uh, Nicole Roche, who is a graduate of Hunter School of Social Work and is currently the director of social work and reentry at the Office of the Appellate Defender. Uh, this program provides services to clients reintegrating into society after prison, including assistance with housing, and medical and mental health, and substance abuse, and employment placement, job training, and government benefits, just about everything. Uh, her program also works closely with the upstate prisons, preparing relevant psychosocial materials for court hearings and eating with legal matters. The program also offers bi-weekly peer empowerment groups, which facilitate support community advocacy among clients. She has an extensive social work background, which includes uh, much forensic work for the Legal Aid Society, which provides pro bono legal assistance to low-income New Yorkers. Our third panelist uh, will be joining us. He's running uh, just a little bit behind schedule, and that will be Council Member Jumani Williams, who is a council member of the 45th District, uh, which is in Brooklyn, and he has a long professional history of community organizing and engagement. He's a first-generation American of West Indian heritage, and he's worked tirelessly to collaborate between nonprofit organizations in his district and has empowered his constituents to join his office in participating in budgetary planning and deciding funding on upcoming projects. He is an active proponent of gun control legislation and leads a youth anti-violence initiative, which provides positive alternatives to young people to keep them off the streets. He is co-chair of the task force to combat, uh, combat gun violence, an interdisciplinary uh, effort that includes crisis intervention, therapeutic and legal services, conflict mediation, and violence prevention programs in schools and community youth centers. So um, it's uh, before I, I hand the microphone over to the commissioner, someone's giving us a signal for time. I have time. She, oh, look at that, right in the front row. <laughs> right. right there. The success of this panel. Yes. <laughs> so we look to you for your guidance and leadership. All right, with that, please give a nice warm welcome to the commissioner. Everybody, uh, good afternoon. Thank you 
so much for having me here as an alum and a lecturer. It's really cool to spend my Saturdays with you guys because I have nothing else to do. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start just talking. I'm going to give a little background just because I can't stand not to. I'm sure you probably heard some of these statistics thrown at you during the course of the day, but it, you know we're just in such a sort of awful place with corrections in America that I, I can't resist to give a little background. And then talk about how probation, we're trying to undo some of the damage that's uh, being done to people through the criminal justice system, uh, both on the adult and juvenile side. And I'm, I prepared a nice lengthy speech. I want you guys to know I did my homework, but I'm really happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on here. Um, so just a, by way of context, I mean, really for the last 40 years, we've done something in America that we really never did before. Not only did we never do it, but no one ever did it. We engaged in, in in a grand experiment in terms of uh, imprisoning our citizens uh, at a rate unseen uh, in our history or anyone else's history. Um, and uh, and that's, that went fairly unabated from when Nixon declared the war on crime in the early 70s until about 2009 when it started to slow. And I don't think anybody knows what's, what's, what's coming next. Um, and, and during that time, there's about a seven-fold increase in the uh, number of people we locked up in our prisons and jails. We're up to about 2.3 million now. It's hovered there uh, for the next two years. Um, when you add the number of people under community supervision, which is a sort of demi deprivation of liberty, um, it goes to over 7 million people. It's the populations of San Diego, Philadelphia, Dallas, I forget the fourth city, but it's, it's a bunch of big cities all put together. Um, to almost the size of New York City um, uh, in terms of the number of people we have in prison and behind bars. It's about one out of every hundred Americans is behind bars, but of course, uh, it's not an equal opportunity uh, program, right? Uh, young men of color are much more likely to find their way into the system and particularly to its deepest ends. Um, one in three African American male babies born in the year 2002 is likely to go to prison at some time in their life. Um, you hear, there's a sentencing card that came out with a study in the 90s that said one in three young black males was under the control of the criminal justice system. The 2002 number was a much more disturbing number. It came out of the Justice Department's lifetime likelihood number. There's a lifetime likelihood number, by the way, if you're ever interested on all sorts of things. How likely different demographic groups are to go to college, and that's you know, by race, by gender, by age, how likely they are to get jobs, how likely they are to go to prison. And so uh, the Justice Department published that number, and it really didn't, what was almost more disturbing was how little publicity that number got when they published it. So it's one in three African-American male babies are likely to go to prison at some time in their lifetime. Not, not jail, lots of people go to jail. Not that many people go to prison. Um, and for Latinos, it's one in six, Latino males. Um, astonishing numbers, numbers that if it was applied to white middle class males or females, uh, would, would bring the system to a solution. It's inconceivable that those kind of numbers would, would be allowed if they were applied to, to white kids. Um, so uh, I started here in 2010. Uh, I had come from the uh, Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services in Washington, D.C., which is the sort of back-end juvenile justice system where kids get committed. Uh, by the way, in the five years I was there, I never had one white kid committed to my care. So only kids of color, almost all African American. And, um, and when I got here, I found what I thought was you know, similar. This is not the back end. This is the front end. It's the Department of Probation. That's right, where people go instead of going to prison. Right? Not parole. Parole is where you go after you come out of prison. We're probation. Uh, we have about 26, 27,000 people under our supervision at the time I got here. It's down to about 24 now. Um, most, 90% uh, of them were adults. Adults in New York is over the age of 16, unlike the other states in America where it's over the age of 18. Uh, New York's age in which you try as adults is 16. And um, uh, it was it was kind of a mediocre, sort of not a horrible place where awful things were done to people, but sort of a loveless bureaucracy. Think of the Department of Motor Vehicles, but you gotta go every week, right? And if you don't go, they send you to prison, right? 
and that's sort of, you know, and there were some good people in there doing good work because good people do good work, and that's what good people do. But, but that was idiosyncratic and, and not systemic. Um, and so uh, it, we did the normal management things. I did a bunch of listening tours. I did 21 listening tours, and um, and then we did a. a strategic plan which has five goals but th th to me it all boils down to three things well, do do less harm do more good and do in the community on the less harm side and I, th I think it's a under under taught element of social work and other do gooding professions is that as we do good we often do unintended harm and the medical profession as for all its faults actually has wrapped its arms around this uh, much better I think than the social work and psychology professions uh, um, you know, every time I take Lipitor, uh, I potentially damage my liver. My doctor checks my liver every year, not because he's a bad doctor who would intentionally harm me, but because he's a good doctor who recognizes that and trying to help me may be harming me. And I don't think we as social workers do enough of that. But, um, so I was determined to do that, right? And of course, in the criminal justice system, uh, the inadvertent harm can include incarceration. Uh, so, so we cut the number of uh, revocations in half uh, in just the first two years. We increased the number of people we discharged early. We're allowed to ask the judges to let somebody go early to 19%. That was, that was a six-fold increase. We were at 3% when I got there. And um, only 3% of them get rearrested uh, within a year of release for felonies, which is pretty damn good for a, a group of young, African, predominantly, disproportionately young African-American or Latino males in New York, it's damn hard, as you heard from two panels ago, to avoid being arrested. Um, so, um, and then we, we really pushed a boatload of barrier-busting initiatives, getting people certificates up for relief from disability. We had 15,000 outstanding warrants, because we had 27,000 people on probation and 15,000 more outstanding warrants. Some of them were 25 years old. So we started, to, I just put a group of staff in a dusty room with a bunch of old files and said, get rid of those warrants. We've got all these people running around, working in the underground economy. They're going to lead cops on a crosstown chase the next time they get pulled over for a broken taillight because of a stupid probation warrant from the 1980s and they haven't been rearrested in 20 years. Otherwise, the warrant would have dropped. It's like, this is called victory. If we got a guy for 20 years not getting rearrested, <laughs> so you know, now we're getting rid of the warrants and you know things like that just to sort of unsaddle folks uh, of, of the detritus that attaches to them in the criminal justice system, which we which we allow to attach to them with alarming frequency. It's not as stunning as the prison numbers, but we're, a lot of people are dragging a lot of crap around with them because of their time in the criminal justice system. We just hired a bunch of groups just to help people clean up their rap sheets. Because if you go in with three charges and the judge convicts you of one, or you plead guilty to one, very often the clerk just forgets to throw the other two away. And so they just hang on to your rap sheet. And you know, I'm a landlord, I didn't sell a place in DC that we left, so when I get new tenants, I do a, a, back, a credit check, right? And, and two seconds after I do a credit check, I get like five emails asking me if I want to do criminal background checks on people. So it's bad enough that that stuff's on there, but any idiot with $15 can do a background check. And so, um, you know, so it really can harm people. So, so that's, that's our efforts to, to do less harm. Um, on the do more good side, we really are training our, our staff in evidence-based practices. There really is evidence that you can um, improve outcomes for people if you, if you, in some respects, do what, what we are all taught in social work. You know, do open-ended questioning, you know, be more asset-based, do for, you know, um, uh, rewards to every punishment. Don't just sit there and threaten people with jail and expect to, you know, foster behavior change that way. Um, and so we're making a really, really big push to, to do that. And asset-based stuff is really hard for the criminal justice system because, frankly, no one's walking into our door voluntarily. The only reason you're there is because of this kind of serious deficit you got called, like, a felony conviction. And so, you know, it, it, it's instinctive to want to extinguish the bad as opposed to promote the good. Um, and it's hard to convince people that one of the best ways to extinguish the bad is to promote the good. 
And so we're working on that. We're training our people like crazy. And we're rewarding the ones that do good. And, and we'll see. We'll see if, how, how we move the dime on that. Um, and, and we were also able, through the Mayor's Young Men's Initiative, to get $30 million worth of new programs. Mentoring, some intense tutoring, and some really good workforce development uh, uh, programs with, with a restorative justice component. Um, and so that's our efforts to do more good. And then do it in the community is what I'm going to spend two, five minutes on talking about. <laughs> she said five minutes. Um, uh, in two ways. On the adult side, um, uh, we, we charted out the neighborhoods that have most of our uh, client sentiments, it's seven neighborhoods, uh, Harlem, South Bronx, Jamaica, East New York, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, and Northern Staten Island. And uh, we opened up offices now. And it's not, our, our centralized offices are Department of Motor Vehicles, except with, with not as good a paint job, right? And, um, and, and they were awful places, and you had 150 guys waiting way longer than 150 guys should wait to have a meaningless 15 minute meeting with a PO. And so we, we said, we gotta bust that up. And we gotta, we gotta change that culture. And so now, by the end of this year, 75% of the people on probation will be seen in these neighborhood offices. They're co-located with a lot of nonprofits, helping you get your GED, workforce development stuff, and, um, and they feel much more like a nonprofit feels. And the, the, uh, the change in my staff in them is remarkable. Just, just smallness, I think, has, has mattered. You know, this sea of humanity coming into your office is sometimes daunting. You know, even for the secretary, they get nasty. And they're not inherently nasty, but big numbers can make you that way. And then on the juvenile side, um, and, and that is going terrific. We're going to measure the heck out of it. And hopefully one day you guys will hear, hear more about it. On the juvenile side, we were able to convince the state to give us back all of the kids in the state-run facilities that come through juvenile court. So it's a watershed change uh, uh, in juvenile justice. And I think it's going to be written about for better or worse for years and years to come, starting with a front page metro section article in the uh, Times at the end of this month. So keep your eyes out for that. The state system was beating the kids up, getting sued. The schools weren't. Uh, certified so the kids could go to school and when they came home none of it counted. That one psychiatrist for a thousand person system with 50 different institutions and I think that person was actually only part time even though 70% of the kids have DSM diagnoses. Uh, it was bad. Justice Department sued. They settled legal aid soon. I think they're going to settle that soon. So it was really a, a really, really challenged system. and. Uh, Having run one of those systems in DC, I know that it's really hard to change those things when folks really have hunkered in. I'm happy to talk to you about that level of institutional change. But the city said, you know what? We, we can't wait. We want to. We want to start fresh. We're going to bring them all back. Uh, and we're putting them in a, into a continuum of community based care in home. Uh, and if they have to be placed out of home, uh, I think 35 different um, resident, residential facilities, either in or really close to the city of Westchester County. Uh, and that's about 300 kids, so those are small facilities, an average of nine kids per facility. Some are a little bigger, some are a little smaller, but there's no large institutions. Uh, that's a watershed change. The only other state that has really small facilities like that is Missouri. I one day hope that there are no longer any large locked facilities for kids. I think kids will always have to be taken out of home and place. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we're unable or where, where we completely end the use of home removals for kids just because some of the families just can't handle some of the behaviors by the kids either because the kids are too out of control or the families just aren't strong enough. Um, but the fact that New York City's kids will no longer go to large, locked, institutionalized training schools is a major, major victory. And the fact that they're close to home, where their lawyers, their parents, advocates, oversight mechanisms can stick their nose in them, I think is a, is a tremendous advantage. And frankly, having run a, 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 a government run system, I think the fact that they're all contracted out to nonprofit organizations is an advantage too. Even though I don't think any of those individual things are a panacea, I think all of them together add up to a, a major in, improvement in, in what's happened to young people. I got one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about my uh, kids. <laughs> 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 okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. This is super awkward. Okay. Um, first, I want to say I'm really 
really, really sad to be sitting next to um, Mr. Shirali and hear about all these wonderful positive changes. Um, my years at Legal Aid Society advocating for alternatives to incarceration and probation at the worst <laughs> um, gave me a very different picture than I have now. And so it's really great to hear about all this stuff going on. Um, and where I am now, I see the back end consequences and results of people who do not succeed in probation and do go upstate for very, very long periods of time. So just a little background about what our office does. I work in a very small criminal appeals office. So like legally, it's a public defender office, but it's post-conviction. So once you're upstate, you want to file an appeal in your case, you can't afford your own lawyer, you get assigned to our office just by the sheer basis of where you were arrested and convicted. Um, why social work in an appeals office? There isn't much room for social work in the courtroom at that point. The legal practice is very, very different than on the trial side. Um, in our office, one of our, uh, our lawyers was a social worker as well. And our office works very, very intimately and holistically with our clients. And she started realizing whether or not the appeal had ended 10 years prior, these guys, and I say guys because the majority of them are men, um, would be calling the office when they got home and being like, uh, I'm homeless, I'm in the shelter, I need food, I don't know what to do with myself. And it sort of grew organically, like we need full-time social work here to do what is now termed re-entry piece. Um, and really help people transition back into the community. So we're not a large organization like Fortune Society or Osborne Association that really does run all those large programs. Um, I view us as more a bridge and a connector to helping people maintain and sustain what they are being mandated to do once they come home and overcome all the tremendous barriers and challenges that they have. Um, so that's the gist of what social work does in my office. Um, so I mean, I think we all know, and I don't want to spend too much time on the concrete collateral consequences and barriers to re-entry. We know you've got felony records that getting a job is going to be hard. We know that housing for every New Yorker is a crisis, but definitely in particular if you have a felony record, if you're coming home with no community ties left anymore. Um, Health is an issue, access to higher education because of a uh, felony record is an issue, money matters, all that stuff. What I have the uh, experience in, in learning from my clients over the past two years is that the sort of social emotional, um, the social and emotional impact is much, much deeper and in my opinion, much more important to help people overcome other than getting housing, because I'm kind of powerless to help them in that situation as well. So a little bit about what happens. When people are getting released from prison, they are handed 40 bucks, whether or not they have hundreds of dollars in their commissary, and put on a bus back to Port Authority. So I want you to just picture for a moment that you have been in, you know, upstate rural New York in a very confined, structured environment for the past 20 years, and, you know, Fine, you're from New York City, but you get spit back up into Times Square after 20 years. Um, it's overwhelming. It is overstimulating. It is scary. It is um, one of my clients, he's been in and out his whole life, all drug related situations. This time he just came out after another 10 years. And <laughs> his first visit to my office, I always like to ask my guys, so what's like the first thing you notice? He's like, I got to Port Authority, and there are no more payphones. And I was like, oh, you're right. There are no more payphones in the city. I mean, simple, simple life functionality that we take for granted. Or they've never seen metro cars. I mean, there were tokens back in the day, you know. Um, so there's these little nuances that are very um, challenging to them that we wouldn't ever think of as being a barrier. Cell phones, technology, I mean. We, we do workshops on site on cell phones and technology, quite literally, because every single one of my clients sits down with me and they're like, how do I use this phone, you know? And I'm like, I don't even know how to use that one. I know how to use the one I have, you know? And it's, it's just these little things to getting through a, a regular day here in the city. Um, the other first thing that happens too is when people are getting ready to be released, 
they create this fantasy of all the new things they're going to do in their life and all the things they're going to achieve and it's all going to fall into place and they have this great plan and they can't wait and they get here and I think we all know like the reality is quite different. Um, things don't happen easy, they don't happen quickly even for somebody who has not been incarcerated for 20 years. It is a struggle, it is a hustle, it is a challenge. You have to like know how to sustain yourself and <clears throat> work with other people and overcome things and that patience and tolerance to frustration and all those things to get through the day. And you know, so you come home, you're on parole. Parole is ruling every move of your life. Um, you've got a felony record, you are homeless, you probably have some mental health issues at this point. You probably have some medical issues at this point, and all of a sudden you're like, this sucks. And every single one of my clients has said to me, it was much easier inside. And the ones that have been inside for more of their adult life than outside often go back and often subconsciously, intentionally. Um, and it's a really sad state, but you know, prison is extremely, as terrible as it is, it's prescriptive, it's predictable, um, and you don't need the same level of self-sufficiency that you do on the outside world. You also learn to become extremely distrustful, extremely hypervigilant. My clients are very reactive, especially when they first come home, it's the overstimulation, but easily startled. Um, they do not trust anybody. They, um, everyone's seen as an adversary. Every service provider, every person in their programs, every person on the sidewalk is sort of like out to get them and against them. Everything's personal. Um, my, one of my clients just had a medical procedure and now let me tell you, this guy went in at 17, he came out in his early 50s. And he is the most remarkable human being I've ever met in my life. The way that he is dealing with things is, I, I'm just, <clears throat> blown away by him. But he just went through these medical procedures and he, you know, had something removed from his eye, he went back to the checkup, everything was fine, but they had sent this out to get tested. Test came back that showed something else was going on and he needs to come back for another procedure. His immediate response though is, do you think I have a lawsuit? Sounds like they're jerking me around. Sounds like they're trying to pull one over on me. And I, you know, it was just, it's these kind of nuanced little conversations that if you, don't have an understanding for the way things work and everybody is viewed as an adversary and you're always defended, that's what leads back to behaviors that get people in trouble again because they're frustrated and they feel like they're banging their head against the wall and they are, and they are further stigmatized and ostracized. And so what we really try to do is A, explain process, B, be their advocate when they really do need an advocate. So show them how to speak tactfully and constructively to other people, help them relax, help ease the <laughs> stress and frustration. So I would say those are the things that aren't spoken about, um, that policies can't change necessarily. I mean, there's some great policy movements out there, like Bay on the Box, so you don't have to say you have a felony record when you're filling out a job application. Um, those things help but really understanding this sort of traumatic emotional response and helping people recalibrate to a completely different world, a completely different way of communicating with others, socialization. We started workshops and you know, social work groups on site, and I thought, well, this would be great. Groups are awesome, blah, blah, blah. And we got <laughs> these eight guys together in a room, and they, every single one went around and said, I don't trust anybody here, especially men. I don't really want to share anything with any of y'all. And I was like, oh, I hadn't realized that. I hadn't the depth of the like isolation and being closed off. And so that was huge. And I individually speak to them at of learning how to trust other human beings again and being open to the possibility that there are good people and that good things can happen. And most of them don't have that or see that, and that I feel like that's the most critical component to being able to, you know, do what you need to do and overcome any challenges. So I'm very happy to report that a year later we have a very active twice a month workshop series going on, and I watch these guys be like, 
it's okay, man. You know that wasn't your fault, right? That your dad was beating up your mom. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And they're like hugging each other. And it's like at least in our rooms. And it's not a treatment program. It's nothing they're being forced to do. So it takes on this really different quality. And to see that they have been able to have positive relationships and positive responses and trusted people with other things. And at least in that bubble, it is a safe space for them. So that's been really nice to see. Um, so and I know that we're going to talk about changes just a little bit. So. Um, and this is a completely different panel topic, but parole policies prohibit people from moving forward greatly in so many different ways that we can't even get into it here. Um, but I think there needs to be more discretion in that. Access to housing through the shelter system. Also, if you are not in the shelter system, you're going to three-quarter houses, which is a whole other hot mess topic. Um, Crisis, serious crisis. Our clients are nationless. You know, they come home, they have nothing. They probably don't have family ties any longer if they've been upstate for 30 years, or most of our family members have died um, while they are incarcerated. So you have really disconnected people, and if you're being shuttled around from shelter to shelter to shelter to sidewalk to three quarter house to wherever, that's going to make things a million times tougher. But our city housing issues are a much broader topic as well. Um, but I think those are two things that really, we need to break down systemic barriers and just perpetuate the, the original problem. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> So uh, encouraging, particularly to to know that there is a social worker in uh, the position of commissioner, and I think that we could use a lot more social workers in the role of commissioner. Uh, we, we, I think in the past we did have more. There's been this trend to put lawyers uh, in these particular positions, and at ECS and others, and not they're not doing a great job, but they're bringing a lawyer's perspective to the work, and I think there is there is an immense value to be gained to have someone from a social work perspective with that set of values uh, to be uh, at a place um, like probation. And, and with that, I want to ask uh, a question of you, Commissioner. And, and that is, you know, the, the, the students at, at Silver, and as you know, as being a former student, Silver, focus a lot of attention looking at social systems and how these systems can result in oppression, in racism, sexism, and how there's institutional uh, um, oppression and, uh, and systemic racism. Um, how, how difficult and challenging is it to address those systems from the inside? Do you feel yourself even being you know, um, constricted by, by the, 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 the systems that go beyond your control? And, and how do you really um, push this so that there is more social justice in, in, in areas like uh, um, probation. You know, I, I, I find it extremely difficult to make change w within systems, but my, the first 25 years of, of my career, I was an outside agitator, an advocate. And, um, and I, they still I, let you be commissioner? Yeah, well, it was, <laughs> honestly, it was an act of desperation by the mayor of DC. <laughs> director of that department in 19 years. Wow. And they were under a consent decree, and things had gotten so bad that the plaintiffs made a motion to put the department, the department into receivership. And so, you know, he could have hired the 20th lifetime juvenile correctional bureaucrat or me, and he just went with me. And, <laughs> you know, honestly, I think it was, I, I think it was an act born of a tremendous amount of pressure, but that zero experience of government. And I just, I knew it was going to take a meat axe to get that job done. I swung that meat axe for five years, and then boom, I got to here. Um, but most folks who grow up in these systems, they don't want to do that, right? They're, they're, they've made their incremental progress through, and they want to make their incremental change. I don't know how we, I really don't know how we do this, right? how we 
how we you know, get rid of these bollocks here. I don't really, no, I don't believe it can be done by in, insiders, and I don't believe it can be done exclusively by outsiders. I think, I think we have to continually be opportunistic and entrepreneurial and look for accommodation of times when we have a, a strong advocacy community and a strong leader, an internal leader, and, and then drive the truck through it as far as we can. Because there's no way I can get bills passed unless there's an enormous amount of external pressure. But we have a second felony offender law in New York. Right? We abolished the Rockefeller drug laws, and we still have a second felony. Why do we have a second felony offender law in New York? Why can't judges make individual decisions about people who commit two property felonies? Why does a judge have to be mandated to send that second felony offender to prison? There's no reason for that, but there's no advocacy on it. Right? All those people who did the Rockefeller drug laws, they sort of went, yeah, and they stopped. We have, we have you get 15% time off for good behavior in state prison. That's because when Bill Clinton was president, he wanted to sort of, you know, what was the word he used to use for it? The, I don't know, triangulate, I think was the word, where he wanted to sort of move to the center. So he, he passed legislation to help states build prisons in exchange. They had to reduce their good time to 15%. It used to be third, half. California was day for day good time. New Yorker was a third. Why is it like forever now going to be 15%? And I, my bet is that the head of corrections right now would like it to be more. The more it is, the better control you have over your inmates, because you can give them some rewards, right? But there, there's no one who's talking about increasing it. Um, and so it really, I think, requires uh, either someone who really doesn't care about the rest of their government career, like me, and there's just not that many people that that's going to be true of, right? Or a really, um, a really uh, strong effort by both external advocates and uh, the internal folks to, uh, to to push the ball forward. Um, because I don't think anyone will do it. Thank you. And, uh, that was so terrific. <laughs> and, uh, and a question for you, uh, Nicole. So, what would what would you say is the like, the single largest area which in which advocates like the one in this room? really focus on and help make a difference in the work that you're doing? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that you should focus on what gets you going the most, what you're most passionate about, have a connection to, and can make the biggest impact as far as criminal justice stuff goes. I think universally, again, beyond like policies and starting new movements to get rid of ridiculous laws and rules that make no sense and ruin people's lives. What I have found is that in my casual conversations with people who are not in this field, I educate them. I educate them on what a, felon, a person with a felony record looks like and what kind of human they are and why the system is sort of unjust and break down those myths and stereotypes that perpetuate fear and further stigmatization. Um, particularly with people who are charged with sex crimes. I mean, that is a whole other symposium that we could have. Um, but it's really, I just educate people in a way that leaves them a little more open and a little more compassionate and a little less narrow-minded. And, and the general public should be because that's what they're fed. You know, we're fed fear and this. Um, but I think it's our job to change that because that will help our clients help the people working with them. Yeah. So I know we have, the council member has not arrived. I should say as a former employee of an elected official, sometimes crises emerge. And uh, we were, it's a blessing that we've even been able to have the commissioner stay for the entire event. So I apologize on behalf of the council member for his not being able to make it. But we do have some time left for uh, a couple questions from uh, the audience. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, commissioner, uh, about uh, providing alternatives to incarceration and combating the overrepresentation in the criminal justice system of persons of color, so both legitimate goals. And yet, a number of earlier panelists would say the problem in New York City is at the front end. In terms of the policing strategies of your colleague, the police commissioner, 
You used to be an outsider, now you're an insider. Could you address those complaints as the only representative of the city of New York today? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to speak about what, what I do. I'm not going to speak about what the other departments in the city do. Um, I will say it's interesting and, and troubling that the city's incarceration rate has dropped like a stone and dropped more significantly than any other jurisdiction in the country in the last 10 years. And I, I get the anger behind stop and frisk, right? All my clients are enraged by it, right? And so it's not, a, it's not distant to me. And the, uh, it's, what, what I, I find too bad about it is that here you have the biggest city in the country that pretty much cut its incarceration rate in half for adults and by two-thirds for juveniles. And as a, as a community, we're not really having an intelligent conversation about how that happened and what other jurisdictions could learn from it because so much of our focus uh, media research-wise is on stop and frisk. I think that's a legitimate place for people to focus both attention and anger, but it's too bad that lost in that is that New York is doing something that no one else, Jersey, uh, is also down quite a bit. California's just started to go down uh, significantly because of the lawsuit. But that's it, Michigan. But that's really kind of it, right? And, and the whole rest of the country is just sort of stalled at its incredibly high incarceration rate. And no one's saying, holy shit, how do they do this in New York? There was a study that came out recently that Mike Jacobson and Jim Austin did that pretty much pinned it on the decline in arrests. I was so dissatisfied with that study, even though I think both of those guys are great researchers. Because there was a, there's been a 50% decline in felony arrests in New York during the same period of time that there's been almost a 50% decline in incarceration. But there was a 50% decline in felony arrests in LA. And their incarceration rate rose. And, and you could take off a bunch of other cities. So I'm sure that the 50% decline in felony arrests helped. But it, it, it can't be the defining um, factor because it happened in a bunch of other places that the incarceration rate still went up in. So what's the difference? What's happening? I think part of what's happening in New York is there's a social safety net that blows any other city I've ever been had experienced uh, in a way. Just in general, but particularly for people involved in the criminal justice system. I mean, if you took, there's a dozen nonprofits in New York, if you put them in Chicago or LA, each one of them would be the biggest nonprofit serving people involved in the system uh, in the city, right? The Fortune Society, Osborne Associates, C CCI, CEO, CCA. These are incredibly sophisticated groups that help people caught up in the criminal justice system. And this this report just you know put it on arrest. The the follow up, there were 125,000 misdemeanor arrests in New York in 2011. 680 of them got put on probation, right? 680, that's like infinitesimally small. 60,000 of them got conditional discharges. The courts are screening the hell out of these arrests. That's not happening any place else. So I can't, I can't engage. I'm going to have this job probably until midnight on December 31st. <laughs> you want to give me a call and have that conversation about that? <laughs> But I do think it's too bad that we don't sort of have a better thing to say about what has happened with the decline in incarceration in New York, that we can converse with the people like us in this room that are sitting in rooms in Chicago, LA, Kansas City, cities around the country, trying to figure out how they're going to get their populations to be cut in half. Because it would be a shame if at this moment, the public opinion has changed a lot, but we haven't pushed anywhere near as much as we should push to get that prison population down. Well, I noticed um, I was in a correctional environment last year for my co-placement. Was that... Did you make parole? Um, <laughs> no, no, it was like before they go to half the house. Huh? If they were on good behavior while they were incarcerated, they would come to us and hope that they could go to a, a workhouse um, so they can gain money before they go home. Um, and what I found was, was that um, a lot of them, generationally, their families have been incarcerated. So 
the, the, the father, um, you know, basically the grandfather, the, the father and the son, and sometimes they even be in the same correctional environment at the same time. Um, so I'm wondering, in terms of prevention efforts, um, I mean, obviously a lot of it has to do with um, with race, but in terms of now, you know, with, with youth who are more at risk because their family is incarcerated, has there ever been thoughts of reaching out, um, you know, looking to see who in the prison system has children and making efforts to reach out to these kids while they're incarcerated? parents incarcerated to make sure they don't end up like their parents? Um, well, I, I mean, I haven't worked in the, like the juvenile lack of facilities. I would say working at Legal Aid for all those years and seeing that cycle through, I mean, number one, New York State needs to stop prosecuting 16 year olds as adults. Yeah. Um, but that's another topic. Um, I, I, I think the systems are fragmented and I, from my experience on that end, when they are sent away and they do the work, but they still come back to communities that are violent and unsafe or very unstable household, it's difficult. I know there's a lot of programs that do go into the homes to make those transitions and bring therapy into homes, a portable therapy, something that somebody does. Um, you probably <laughs> know, right? yeah. um, so I mean, I think, I think that's incredibly um, important, but how do you address generational like poverty? Really, I mean, I think that's what we have to get to the core of here, and seeing that that generational cycle of incarceration. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I have two questions, um, uh, Commissioner. Can you talk about your department's efforts for gang interventions? Uh, and the second one might be about if you could help us understand about your evidence-based practices that you spoke of. Yeah, I don't think we really do much of interest on gang interventions. Um, I think that I've I've shied away from it a little bit because, again, I really am cautious about doing damage when I'm trying to do good, and I've seen a lot of damage done in the name of, of helping people in gangs or intervening in gangs because. Every Latino and black kid all of a sudden becomes identified as a gang member. Uh, and I, I'm, I've yet to be satisfied that there's a good way to do it. Could be I'm, I'm ignorant of a good way to do it, but I, I, I'm always cautious about it. I, I hate when we, when we as a government label people. And especially with the fact that beginning, it's often, it's often benign and even you know, sort of good intention, well intentioned, and, uh, and then it deteriorates to everybody that's got this tattoo. Or, that color hair, or, so so we haven't done that. I would say any kind of interest in that area. Um, but thanks for asking. I don't think feel good. Um, <laughs> and uh, and evidence-based practices. Um, the, the National Institute of Corrections actually does a nice job of, of of sort of helping provide technical assistance to jurisdictions that want to become more evidence-based. I mean, we're very shoot from the hip, gut level department now, and some of that was. So, like I said before, some people idiosyncratically did well in that environment, but overall our practice is, is mediocre. The actual work we do with people, is, the mayor actually called it a compliance bill once, and I, I was surprised he even knew enough about probation to know that that's what we were. But people were really very heavily fixed at it. When I did my focus groups, once they got past the fact of being afraid to tell me what they really thought and told me what they really thought, they, they felt like idiots having to be a compliance bill. And they fairly spat the word compliance out. The department had a really good case management system so that we could like force our people to, to see people X number of times a week. And we were just really, it was just a complete no. And so, so we're now, we've got a new risk assessment instrument, we're training the heck out of our staff, we're trying to reward the kind of behavior very publicly that we want to see. We have an event every month as well as a citywide event every year that rewards people that go the extra mile with their clients instead of just opening them, sending them to prison. Uh, we, we have elaborate evidence-based conversations that we broadcast to all of our offices that discuss cases and how the old way used to just, oh, you have a drug problem, I'm going to refer you. Oh, you go, I'm going to refer you to another case. I'm going to refer you to another case. I'm going to refer you to another case. Sort of, let's just refer this guy to death. And, 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 and the fact that you know, we don't even know what stage of change he's at, we're not using motivational interviewing to get him from here to where we hope he can, and can be to succeed. 
that's a lot of change. It's a lot of stuff to try to explain to people that are so used to just saying, do it, or I'll send you to jail. I don't have this conversation. I got 20 guys waiting for me. Just do it. Right? Yeah. And so, so the, uh, that was, there's like if you ask my evidence based practice director, he could give you a much better answer than that, but that's kind of what it is. We have time for one more question. Yeah, Mike. I, I just want to just because I think this is really important, and I appreciate your question because I think I, I do think we should talk about the systemic nature of what racism is about, and also like let's talk about the economic situation about jobs and how that plays a role. We just <laughs> talked about it in regard to trans women and what sex work looks like because I don't want people to leave here, particularly because we're in a political program that kind of does come from the basis of everything being deficit-based, and that somehow inherently people are somehow going into the prison industrial complex based on some inherent defect of their own, and not as the as in the stock and frisk catalogs, people talk about colonialization and the history of racism in this country and, and economic uh, exploitation of people, particularly we can go into all different kinds of um, communities and talk about that and all different kinds of particular people of color. So I do want to come back to this question about, so what is the work that is being done around jobs, around economic justice, around racial justice um, in regard to the work that you're doing? So on both the adult and juvenile side, we've come up with a, we do two big things in probation. One is we make recommendations to the court, and the other is we supervise people, right? So the making recommendation was all seated of pants stuff. What we've done is we've moved to a structured decision-making model for juveniles, and we're almost done with one for adults that assesses people's risk, uh, evidence-based risk assessment instrument, and it categorizes offense severity. In the absence of that, what's, what tends to happen in both systems, adult and juveniles, is that particularly on the lower end uh, crimes, uh, people of color get a worse deal, right? Pretty much everybody who commits a rape or a murder is going to prison. But not everybody who does a hand-to-hand -hand sale of, of drugs is going to prison. There's a lot, the more discretion, very often, and, and now with more discretion in drug laws, you'll, it won't, re it might reduce incarceration, but it won't necessarily reduce disproportionality. It may exacerbate it, right? But if, so what, that's why we created a structured decision-making model. And what we're able to do now is in every box, the box, people should be overridden and underwritten. I'm, I'm okay with it. Right? I'm allowed, I'm, I'm fine if my staff says, hey, look, there were special circumstances. We had to go up on the uh, of what the box would tell us to recommend. Or this one's particularly good, we went below, right? But over time, those things should play themselves out equally across race, right, and gender. And we can now measure that before I could. So now, what I can do is I can say, in this box, we've accounted for all the things we think legalistically we should account for, offense severity and risk. So if 90% of the people that get an override are black, I got a problem. Or I can do it by staff member. So if 90% of yours are black, but you're about 50-50, then I come and have a conversation with you. And over time, I can, this is what us bureaucrats do. We can turn the screws if we pay attention to the kids. Now, that's a, that's a very bureaucratic answer, right? The whole neon neighborhood uh, office that I talked about, that's premised on the justice reinvestment model that started from a bunch of prisoners in Greenhaven in the 70s putting out a piece of research that said 75% of the people in state prison in New York come from seven neighborhoods in New York City, and those are the seven neighborhoods we put the, the neons in. It's still the same neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're pouring resources in there. Every time we issue a contract, we, uh, we say that the successful bidders gain extra points if they have cultural relevance and they're able to show us that they have knowledge in a neighborhood. And every bidder had to do, uh, uh, give us a plan to hire people from the neighborhood. We couldn't mandate that they hire people from the neighborhood. I wanted to do that, but the lawyers told me I couldn't. But we could mandate that they at least develop a neighborhood hiring plan. And lo and behold, most of them are hiring people from the neighborhood. And we got away from a lot of the big vendors, who I love. I love the Fortune Society. I love the Osborne Association. But they don't necessarily know Brownsville the way some of the groups in Brownsville or South Bronx or, or whatever know those groups. So 
the, the, the justice reinvestment notions are that as we downsize prisons, we should take the money that we used to take from those neighborhoods and put in upstate New York and reverse it to go back down to the neighborhoods. We haven't gotten a state to agree to that, although we tried last year, right, to actually say, as we're downsizing, we want some of that money. That didn't happen, although we tried. But we did put our own resources into those seven neighborhoods. And that's a little economic development. So it's just the beginning. I think that as we go forward and advocate, we really need to put real, true reinvestment on the table. The Justice Department has a whole justice reinvestment uh, uh, initiative, and it really takes the money from the correctional bureaucracies and puts them into the probation bureaucracies, which is better than keeping them in prisons, but it's nowhere near as good as using them for economic development in the neighborhoods from which we've been snatching people for the last four decades. Um, but that's, that's a, that's, that, I think, needs to go hand in hand with any effort to downsize correctional policy. True reinvestment system. So. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank.